Hey kids, you're listening to the internet's wettest podcast about video games, consoles, and pancakes. The SML Podcast. What's up, everybody? This is the SML Podcast. I am your host, Joe. We have a party cast coming up later on in the show, but we're going to kick things off. Bree's here. Bree, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. How about yourself? I'm, I'm doing okay. Uh, we're supposed to have Aki here, but we don't know where she is. Uh, so hopefully things are good. Well, hopefully she'll be here in time for the party cast. <laughs> Hope so. She's not usually part of those, though. So. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, anyway, we have a guest joining us. <laughs> <laughs> Zalavir Nelson Jr. of Strange Scaffold is joining the show. Zalavir, how are you doing? I am doing pretty good this Friday. Your game just came out this week, El Paso Elsewhere. Uh, for the people who don't know what this game is, give us the sales pitch. What is this game? El Paso Elsewhere is a throwback third-person shooter that, like the ones you remember playing, stuff like Max Payne, stuff like Dead to Rights, and <laughs> Die Hard Trilogy on the PS1. The idea of no progression uh, bars and XP systems and tech trees. It's just shooting cool things and looking cool while you do it. You play as a vampire hunter who is going back to his hometown in El Paso, Texas, to stop the monster he loved before she ends the world. And what that will require is you to dive into a dimension shifting motel that quickly begins to break down into new scenery like like uh, ancient castles <laughs> and Victorian graveyards, all in the pursuit of resolving not only a relationship trauma, but also uh, how many times can you fill this werewolf with lead in a sick backwards <laughs> dive? Uh, my record is about 30. 30 shots in one dive. Uh, it's... It, the faster the gun, the easier it is to pull off. <laughs> Man, that's a that's a lot of bullets in one dive. And it's been a while since we've had a shooter that was kind of that focused. We've had this beautiful opportunity as games has advanced to add things like tech trees and skill systems and even choice based narrative uh, game spiral. Uh, in terms of their scope and ambition every day. But that does mean that in the process, because of how video games tends to work, we leave behind all the people who did really enjoy playing a classic third-person shooter the same way we did people who enjoyed playing a classic first-person shooter. And as an industry, we kind of unilaterally said, yeah, but people don't want that anymore. And the rave reviews and the reception and sales for El Paso elsewhere, I think, prove otherwise pretty definitively i was just about to ask what's the reception been so far and uh, it sounds like things are looking good for it it's really interesting on our side because i thought we would get sixes and sevens not because the game wasn't good but because the priorities of strange scaffold we're trying to make games better faster cheaper and healthier than the industry assumes as possible so that means that we aren't trying to just take the largest budget we can and shove it into one game for as long <laughs> as we can and hope that everything turns out okay, both for the project as a whole, for our players, as well as for the studio itself. Uh, so I thought that that kind of approach wouldn't necessarily get more than a six or a seven or that people would be like, yeah, it's good, but what if it had, had a budget? of another 10 times what if it had been a million dollars instead of less what if it had been what if the characters faces uh ha all had distinct animation and blinking systems and teeth putting early ps2 era teeth in this game would have made it even more <laughs> horrifying but i thought that that was the type of reception we would get just based off of even how we see triple a projects when they are making really precise intentional creative choices We've seen them get really slammed in the past couple of years. 
there is not a clear understanding of how process and the process that you use to make a game and the decisions you make all actually feed back into the game's quality rather than its compromise. And uh, instead, it's been eights and nines and tens across the board. A lot of people streaming the game and talking the game and calling it a game of the year contender. A lot of people talking about how much they want to bang the main character. Every time I search (laughs) El Paso elsewhere on different social media, just like keeping updated on the project, folks enthusiastic about what we've laid down and how we laid it down, actually. And that has been one of the most gratifying and validating experiences of my career. It's great. Has there been any Rule 34 artwork yet? <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't looked on Rule 34 itself yet, but if it hasn't happened yet, the, the, cl- the countdown has started ticking as soon as you said those <laughs> words. <laughs> uh, Bree, I know you've been playing the game. What are your thoughts? What kind of questions I... do you have? Well, I, I mean, I, I have a, I have one question that's kind of sweeping and broad here, but um, I'm, I'm curious as to like other, other influences. Like I know Max Payne's been brought up, but are, are there any other particular influences? I got like little hints of things that I've enjoyed from other popular media, whether it was movies or games or that sort of thing. I'd, I'd love to hear more influences that might have gone into this idea. It's a giant smorgasbord. Uh, the Constantine film with Keanu Reeves Mm -hmm. was a big one. That's, in fact, why the shotgun is named Calvary. Nice. Not only because vaguely biblical names uh, for weapons is objectively a cool choice, but also because if I was not more, let's say, conscious of copyright infringement, Mm -hmm. the the gun (laughs) would have been straight up cross-shaped like in Constantine. Fair. That top-down shot in Constantine... Mm-hmm. where uh, he's making his way through the hospital of distorted vampires and demons. It's amazing. Uh, Hotline Miami played an influence on the gameplay and patterns and rhythms that we went into. It's actually interesting mm-hmm. how much Max Payne is kind of a stylistic touch point, and some of the level design and narrative decisions harken back to it, but so much more of what we actually do and how we do it is looking at Doom 1, Quake 1, Hotline Miami, action games and other genres, as I mentioned, the Die Hard trilogy on PS1. Ooh. Uh, John Wick and all manner of neo-noir films. There's a little bit in here. It's a little bit, but it is a significant bit from a movie called... Uh, I have to think of the exact, the exact title. It stars Ryan Gosling... It is an independent movie called Lars and the Real Girl mm. about Ryan Gosling as a weird guy in a small town who buys a real doll. Uh, yes, I have seen that, real actually, doll yes. Being that real doll. <laughs> There's a little bit of that in there, in the sincerity of it, in the uh, specific idea of what it lays down and how it does it. There's... Yeah all sorts of musical influences from Thumb 41 and Nancy Sinatra songs to Wu-Tang Clan and Clipping and Kendrick Lamar and just stuff all over the map. El Paso Elsewhere is a massive agglomeration of inspirations and influences all taken to try to be more than the sum of its parts, honestly. Saying that there is a lot of things that we love and a lot of things that could contribute to this type of creative vision, and the job of creation is not to go into uncharted territory necessarily, but to look at what can add to this game and over and over again ask, does this thing that we like actually add to the final vision of the game? Does this thing that we care about? Does this piece of our inspiration is that something that should actually be retained? Or is the job to breach new ground and to do so with a lot of sincerity? So I'd say actually one of the biggest differences between the early versions of the game and the game that released is just how often uh, an early decision made for the project. Mm. So, for example, at one point we had destructible weapons. Uh, Weapons could break apart in your hands to create more of the survival horror flow where you were not just managing how much ammo you had, 
but weapons were snapping apart in your hands as you were using them because of the degradable weapon quality and you were trying to find the next weapon and it was forcing you to use the other stuff in your tool set there was cool mechanical stuff there but the question was are we making something that's survival horror or are we making a more supernatural action game uh, in a similar way a lot of the early script the script got entirely thrown out the window and restarted in the be- at, near the beginning of 2022 and so much of that was the script was about half done maybe two-thirds done but the overwhelming thought i had as the the writer and director of the game was this feels very much like more of a parody more of a pastiche more arch and ironic and brooding noir where is the honesty how do we make this character really an exposed raw nerve of a man so that people are connecting with him not because he reminds him of max Payne, but because he is so terrifyingly himself all of it i think uh produces a really unique balance I would say definitely you hit a good balance on a lot of those things. And that was kind of, you know, why I I even started out that question, because one of the things that I kept thinking of is like, oh, this kind of reminds me of a little bit of this. And this kind of reminds me a little bit of that, but it's still its own thing. And I feel like definitely I, I would say the way to put it is you found you found your own voice for both the character and the game direction. So so, yeah, balance is is the right word there. Thank you very much, very much for that. It's been a three three and a half year journey but we're really proud of what we did three and a half years uh uh, did it start before the pandemic or was this a product of the pandemic it's our production in the middle of the pandemic and fortunately because of how we work a lot of our games were just able to continue development during the pandemic because we were already a fully remote team how big of a crew are you managing at strange scaffold So not including external partners, like we have a fantastic set of QA people that we regularly work with. We have, I'd say, an artistic community composed of around 80-something people now. Oh, wow. And it's very Stone Soup style. Uh, We've talked about the way the studio is organized before. I call it the Constellation model. But there's some people in the credits who, first of all, they were fairly credited and compensated even though they only did one thing and they might have just done that one thing but it's like one specific thing from this person another specific thing from this person you end up with a fairly large team and a lot of internal people providing their input and creative energy as well rather than the very valid approach but also to some degree the limited one of having this one really really small team maybe three four or five people in a room, uh, uh, trapped together, desperately trying to make the game work or everything falls apart for all of them. Mm. It's really cool that such a, a wide variety of people could come together and put together such a, a cool game. Uh, you mentioned that there were degradable weapons in the game, but that was removed. What other, what other kind of stuff is on the cutting room floor that was in the game and just didn't feel right? Um... There wasn't too much in aggregate. Degradable weapons was kind of the big one, partially because I do think that Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom and what degradable weapons add to that landscape and how you adventure is so important. But this game was not the time to make that point. Uh, (laughs) Outside of that, there wasn't too much that I remember us really cutting. The Strange Scaffold approach in general is measure twice, cut once, and really, again, ask precisely what does the game need really far ahead of time? So the um, so a lot of what our games are from the game design document, from the ideation and like thought stage, don't massively change course during development. And we've been told you can't, make games that way. That was a big part of my initial starting of the studio. In fact, people told me, yeah, you can't, no one makes a game design document and follows it like that never remains relevant. And there's certainly creative approaches you can do where that doesn't remain relevant, but you can also absolutely plan what you're going to make and how you're going to build it 
ahead of time. Every other creative medium does it. There's no reason that video games is particularly exempt to having the ability to plan for the benefit of the players and what that experience is supposed to deliver. So we had breakable weapons. And at one point you were supposed to go through levels, finding hostages. And then once you activated them, you were supposed to protect them from vampires as they attacked you. Mm. And basically how much you focused on protecting hostages versus just making your mate through the level itself played a part in the overall balance and configuration of the game but we ended up ditching that in favor of something more clean and that let us make more varied missions because if you have to always make a level where you can save hostages and then you can escort them back that means that the levels cannot fully transform and take advantage of the surreal context because hostages always have to be have a way that they can goofily run back to the elevator (laughs) we removed that and we removed breakable weapons, although it's still in the code. And everything else has kind of remained on the same track throughout development. It's something that uh, we pride ourselves on. So since the breakable weapons are still in the code, is that something that you can like unleash in an update in like an extra hard mode? So we are considering it. We aren't promising anything yet, but the long story short of what, the future of El Paso Elsewhere looks like is us continuing to do quality of life fixes and tweaks, uh, bug fixes, of course. And then from there, adding in a variety of modifiers and conditionals, like allowing you to increase how much damage. Uh, you, We already have it to where you can increase the amount of damage you can take as a player from enemies to make for a higher challenge. But more granular conditions and things like a infinite stakes mode, for example. I believe that's already triggered if you have infinite ammo, but only giving you infinite stakes as opposed to making all of your ammo infinite and little stuff like that. The idea of giving the player more adjustable conditions for what their ideal El Paso Elsewhere experience looks like is on the docket and... It may or may not include breakable weapons. Uh, we will have to see. <laughs> but long story short, soon after develop, uh, soon in the near in the next like few months or so, uh, we will be doing a patch that, on top of adding a bunch of additional what, what we call modifiers, will let actually break them into distinct modes. So, story mode, intended mode, and challenging mode or difficult mode for people who want this game to hit them in the face as hard as soon as humanly possible. <laughs> yeah, I loved the modifiers being right there up front so you could kind of play around and see what you wanted to do with that. Um, and I've definitely played with a combination of things. I got to a certain point where you start getting the the screaming bride or whatever character or enemies. And I was like, hmm, no, maybe we want to tone that down a little bit until I get used to where they're firing <laughs> from and how they move. Because, yeah, that, that was a little shocking at first, how they kind of zoom around the screen up high. And I had, like got so much chaos at one point, I could not keep track of them. Because there's just like werewolves exploding out of walls. And <laughs> yeah, that was, that, was, that was absolute chaos. So, yeah, I went, I went back and restarted the level and just like tweaked the modifiers a little bit easier for myself. <laughs> and that's great. That's, I think, something that's, really important for games because we aren't just like films. We have different things happening that Mm -hmm. are going to hit different players in different ways and giving players controls that while still suiting the vision of the game really deliberately bring across this idea of, Hey, the brides are a bit much for you right now. There is no shame in you changing the way the game works. Mm-hmm. That's actually why one of the updates we're going to be introducing is game speed. So right now the game is always going at 100% speed for both people with disabilities as well as those brides are zooming around the screen. Everyone has a different cognitive load that they can absorb. Mm-hmm. You just want everything to move a little bit slower. And that oh, way yeah. you can pull off that the sick slow yeah. motion moves that you want. That's already in the game code. We're making sure that all of that stuff is stable before we fully launch it to players. But 
that's an active piece of what we're thinking about for the future of the game and for the modifiers is, yeah, turn it down to half speed, and then you can do slow-mo on top of that. That way you can still be a superhero, which is the intended vibe and feeling, Mm -hmm. even if you're playing at the different game speed as anyone else. And to that point, we also made sure that no achievements get disabled if you play, for example, with infinite ammo. Because you should not be deprived of achievements just because you can't quite aim as as good as anyone else. (laughs) Yeah. And I thank you for that because I'm not (laughs) good at shooters. Like, I I struggle (laughs) with aiming in a lot of games and a lot of fast-paced games. Uh, I I sometimes get motion sick playing games like that. And having something like an infinite ammo or an infinite health... It makes it easier for me and others to to really get into it and to approach it and enjoy it. So thank yeah. you for that mindset. <laughs> it is tough sometimes talking to players about this, though, because we talk about the intended experience and the fact that you can make it harder through the modifier menu and how that means that more people can play. And you'll have people banging down your door saying... Okay, but what about me? Where's my challenge? And it's like, well, there's a modifiers <laughs> menu, and the people who need a little bit of extra help, they seem to have no problem going to the modifiers menu, but it's the challenge minded gamers who seem to have uh, an internal block or a desire that the default mode of the game is the one that kicks everyone in the teeth uh, mm-hmm. universally. And even explaining that you can adjust the experience to make it more so that way. Absolutely. They don't seem to uh, have a... How do I put this? They seem to find that being an impingement on their skill rather than as something that allows more people to express their skill and uh, abilities and desire. So that is, that is always a little bit of a weird one when you've added these options and you've created this space for more people to play. And there's certain players who explicitly don't care and don't like it. And extending that to some of the other games we've made space warlord, organ trading simulator. Love that game, by the way. (laughs) Thank you so much. Um, There's some interesting accessible things inherent in that design. We believe in building for approachability and an expanded group of people who can play from the beginning but people who optimize to the point that they remove their own fun they're like i can just play the stock market and when this and when i get enough money on the stock market then if the stock market goes down i can just buy stocks for cheap and still make money when it the market goes back up and when the stocks go high i can sell all of my stuff and be making more money than anyone else still and we were like, mm-hmm. first of all, that is the point because capitalism is broken. You've mm-hmm. congratulations, you've experienced <laughs> yeah. the the problem at the heart of all of this. And then the second one is uh yeah, when we're making things like Teenage Demon Slayer Society, which is a which is Devil May Cry, but turn based, especially if your reflexes you, you love the verve and the style of Devil May Cry, but the flesh is is weak where the spirit is willing. Teenage Demon Slayer Society brings that to you in this really fun, poppy new environment. And folks who find that to be a problem or who are like, well, even though this is focused on being a really fun action game for more people, what I want should be the default mode for everybody. We just, at the end of the day, frankly, just aren't making games for them. We respect them as a piece of our audience. We try to create also accommodations for them to get more of that challenge or difficulty. But we aren't going to throw out every other player on the behalf of the small amount of people who say that you should, in some cases, remove the fun from your games so that they can receive the specific challenge that they're looking for. I mean, I would argue that there is at least one achievement in the list for El Paso elsewhere that does still require, you know, a certain amount of skill. You can you can muddle with the modifiers all you want, but uh, is actually mm. another point I, I thought was interesting is like an extra mental challenge in addition to shooting was that the enemies seem to have different uh, special like headshot locations. And uh, there is an achievement I noticed for hitting all of those weak points. 
Uh, so that's still going to take a little bit of uh, skill on someone's part to work their way through at whatever length of time it takes them based on those modifiers or difficulty that they want to go through. So, I mean, it's not like you haven't added some elements and goals for that there. Absolutely. Uh, because challenge and giving people some resistance is important too. It's just for everyone, that's going to be a sliding scale. And as long as the game vision is retained, making sure that that sliding scale is acknowledged as much as you have the time and space and budget to do so. I think it's one of the best things about game development right now. The fact that so many games are so playable by so many people across different platforms. It's part of why I think we live in a golden age at the moment. There's nothing quite like it. Yeah, I definitely appreciate, though, how you respect the gamer's time. Like, there's games that come out with achievement lists that are basically all things of, like, a beta on insane difficulty. Like, I'm in my 40s. I don't have time for that shit. I just want to, like, <laughs> play it on easy and get through the game. <laughs> yeah. It's notable how much of that is partially, I'll be honest, it's a, it's a development decision. Like, we're setting up how many weak points you have to, to hit throughout the game. And even I just think through mentally as a player, let alone implementing it, but just like mentally as a player, it's like, I don't want to freaking hit 5,000 things. Just give them an achievement <laughs> after 150. Give them an achievement after 500. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't matter. As opposed to, it does matter for the bride to teleport around and be a little bit of a nightmare or the puppeteer to mm. be the bane of your existence. That mm -hmm. is a place where annoyance and where challenge and where specific friction gives you something that you totally lose when it is removed. So planting your flag where it matters and honestly, sometimes making mistakes there and then learning from them and sometimes fixing them in the game where you can. I think all of that goes towards making the best games possible and reaching as many players as possible. We've been talking about achievements. Uh, we There are some publishers out there who uh, they love their achievements and we'll get like title <laughs> updates after title updates every couple of weeks, adding another thousand points to the game. Have you considered adding more achievements to the game? No. no <laughs> <laughs> we'll fix bugs. We will even add things like, again, more modifiers. But what... Maybe this is old fashioned of me, but the idea that I turn my head, I've reached completed achievements on a game and they added another achievement, <laughs> especially if they especially if there's no content to justify it. Like if it's a major gameplay expansion, basically the 2.0 thing, it's like, OK, you want to add more achievements, that's good on you. But if it's just the game as it is and they're like, ah, found a new achievement for you. Absolutely not. Get that out of here. <laughs> yes. So what do you what do you think of games that are out there that just put stock into being all about achievements? Like you'll get games that release that you could get a thousand achievement points in like five minutes and then they release a title update with another thousand points you could get in another five minutes. Do you think that devalues other games on the market or do you think they're just in their own little category? I think you put it perfectly by saying that's a whole category of its own. I don't think that that's too common of a thing. And when it is a thing, the game is almost secondary to how much they're focusing on achievements. So for the players who buy them and who want that gamer score, that sweet, sweet gamer score so much, <laughs> if they're willing to live with the black mark on their conscience, <laughs> what they've all done, then that's fine. At the end of the day, it's, it's just games, and I hesitate to use that phrasing because games are important. Games add meaningful, interesting things to people's lives in ways that other mediums can't or don't. But remembering both that this is an incredibly meaningful form of entertainment with a lot of expression within it, while also keeping in mind, for example, uh, when I play a game and it's a bit buggy, I'm like, yeah, but it's a video game, though. This is barring major incidences or a lack of quality control. This isn't the end of the world or worst case scenario. I put down the game for a little bit until the developers fix it because we live in an age where 
unlike when I was growing up playing games, that game was broken forever. That quest was broken forever. Yeah. It often is either actively being fixed already or it will be fixed in the future. We live in a good time to play games and a good time to honestly uh, make games as well. There's just other systemic factors that, if anything, are working to counteract all of that good. And that's part of what Strange Scaffold is trying to also ask questions on on a regular basis. So what games are you playing these days yourself? Speaking of updates, I'm playing a lot of that new Cyberpunk update. I picked up the DLC. I, I did enjoy it at launch. I didn't run into a lot of the issues other people did. But seeing them turn around that story and also create this amazing new expansion has been a delight. I'm playing... Now that I think about it, I'm playing a lot of games that got fixed. <laughs> Saints Row, mm. the reboot, mm. had bugs at launch, but the game and what it's putting down is incredibly interesting and surprisingly fresh, despite the fact that it has icons on a map. How it treats those icons on a map and how it's trying to create an experience that is fresh and meaningfully evolving for the player over the course of the experience is amazing. I mourn the death of Volition and the fact that the game kind of did get branded with just a big old bad mark at launch, despite the fact that the difference between that Saints Row reboot and Cyberpunk is money. The initial sales that they got and also how much money was continuing to get poured into the game and its marketing. No Man's Sky got to have a total transformation. There's people who miss that original version of that game, but it got to have a total transformation because it sold so many copies at launch. So I'm not playing No Man's Sky, but I, I see that arc happening and I, I want it to have to... I want that sort of grace to be extended to more games inherently, and I am practicing that grace myself even when it's frustrating. Uh, sometimes a game isn't for me, or a sequel isn't for me, or an update isn't for me. And you know what? There's a lot of other games I could be playing, and that just means I can move on and wish the developer or that ex with experience that I used to enjoy well. Uh, I'm playing Fortnite, because I'm basic as hell. Uh, <laughs> and Fortnite does really interesting things with live service stuff and with design. I'm playing a bit of Starfield now and again, although Cyberpunk did derail some of that playthrough. I am playing Vanquish for the first time, and this feels like the spiritual cousin of Binary Domain, where you both we had two prominent Japanese developers do their take on the cover-based shooter, and it's rad as hell, and both of them didn't sell as well as they deserved at the time. And... Nonetheless, they make you like fist pump every five minutes because of how they're designed <laughs> and how they play. I play a lot of stuff all the time, and that's part of why our games are able to pull from so many sources is because uh, I try to consciously avoid hyper focuses and also biases. I got I got to agree with you on Saints Row. I think it got a bad rap. Uh, I think if it was called anything else, it would have fared better. I think people had too many expectations of what Saints Row should be. And I think that that hindered a lot of expectations on the game. But I had mm. fun with it. I didn't think it was a bad experience. I I, I thought also it, had fun with it. I thought there was some solid, funny stuff in there. It just honest. It wasn't Saints Row. It it didn't have the same vibe as as the rest of the series. And I understand that they wanted to do a fresh reboot, but like you could have thrown Gat in there, like throw a <laughs> statue of him or something, have him be in. I don't know, a cameo character. Like, he was in Agents of Mayhem, and that they tried to keep that as far away from Saints Row as they could, and that still ended up having him in there. But, I don't know. I That's, think you, you raise a really good point in particular of how uh, the that new Saints Row game, it's particular... The thing that broke my heart most of its reception once I played it myself was that people said it wasn't funny. And it is funny it is not the exact same type of funny as some of the previous saints row games but for example uh one of the most interesting things they do that i saw as a developer was they give you a repeated type of quest right you unlock a new type of repeated quest in this case the insurance fraud missions that you saw in previous games in the series and you walk up to unlock that quest for the first time and you meet a scientist in a doctor's coat and they tell you about this whole 
AI based scam that they're basically going to run on the insurance companies. And your boss is one giant dumb as rocks ball of chaos and goes, <laughs> okay, so I need to throw myself into traffic, right? To like create the basis of reports. So they're like, no, no, I just described how I have an entire system that will do that automatically. No one has to get hurt. And in successive missions, we're just going to more extreme lengths of how the boss does not understand to a degree, does not care, is just really committed to throwing themselves into traffic. Is like, yeah, we're going to get this money. Let's do it. Hustle culture, <laughs> grind set. And, you're, and the doctor's like, please, no, you are going to die. <laughs> That's funny. That's weird. And it's offbeat. And it, 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 I would argue it is Saints Row and the fact that it looks a little bit different, and I think the marketing is what killed it here. The marketing so much tried to say, it's a grounded reboot. It's a grounded reboot. It's not like the Saints Row you're, that you played. It's a new type of thing. Kept people from seeing how much it was spiritually aligned, but just interpreting it slightly differently. I did love the LARPing cat, stuff, he's screaming. too. He, he's been fed and watered, but he's being bratty right now. Oh, I have a bratty cat yelling at me, too. It's about uh, 19 minutes away from time to feed her, and she has let me know. <laughs> I fed my herd earlier. I have way too many cats. <laughs> How many cats are we talking? Oh, man. Uh, 15. <laughs> 15? Yeah. <laughs> I am married. I will put that I... out there. I, I have a <laughs> wife. <so. laughs> it's, not just, it's not just me alone with 15 cats here. <laughs> I would have guessed a number lower than 15 when you yeah. say a lot of cats. Yeah, most people do. They're like, oh, what, like five? Four. Yeah. <laughs> I remember those days. Five. Those were easy days. <laughs> yeah, four is the most I've had at one time. They just, and I thought that was a lot. They just keep showing up and we can't get rid of them and they're not dying. So. But it was, it's delightful to be around that many cats, I'm going to say. Oh, like, it is. You know, d- despite the, the other things that come with it, like it, it was really nice to just have cats everywhere. It's great. Yeah, Brie visited. Everywhere you look, a, a surface is occupied by a cat. Pretty much. I'm trying to count how many are in my room right now. I count six right now, <laughs> just in my office. I think I got some like random snuggles when I was staying in the guest room. Like you know, like at least two or three different cats that came to like hang out and just like cuddle <laughs> with me. And I was like, this is great. <laughs> if yeah, if need be, you can be carried down the street. People. Parading you, <laughs> celebrating your name, throwing confetti, and the cats can be the ones carrying you. They yeah. uh, just floating on a on an eternal crowd surf of loyal cats. It's amazing. I figured it'd be funnier if it was like a dog sled kind of situation, and they were just pulling me on like a red carpet. Hmm. I have crazy dreams about these cats. <laughs> but they're cats. Would they actually be that industrious? I mean, no, no, not unless there were treats at the end of the road. We definitely have to have something like leading them on then, like a big bowl, of, like a trough of catnip on a little slow moving Roomba. <laughs> <laughs> we actually bought a hat for Simon that's just like a little shark head that has a dangling treat at the yes. end of it. And he he just tries grabbing it and he'll just walk follow. It's it's amazing. I love Simon. He's weird. <laughs> Tell us about your cat. <laughs> so. I wasn't supposed to have cats, is the thing. I didn't want cats, per se. But (laughs) my little sister, she is teaching science at NASA Space Camp down in in Alabama. uh, The actual NASA Space Camp. Nice. And she said, hey, I'm going to be doing this really cool thing. Can you take care of my cats while I go? And she's been living with me anyways. So I know these cats. They know me. We have a mutual understanding. I'm like, yeah, okay, sure. I'll take care of your cats. <laughs> and he leaves. And then she tells me, hey, by the way, I'm also going to grad school. You think you can watch them for that? And I was like, what, 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 do you, what do you mean you're going to grad school? She's like, yeah, I'm going to grad school. <laughs> uh, I, can't, I, can't, I can't have cats in the dorms or anything. And I was like, Are, how long does grad school take? She says, oh, just two or three years. Mm-hmm. Uh so long story Congrats, short, I have, have cats. <laughs> yeah. I have cats. At some point, my parents tell me that she will never return for the cats, but hope springs eternal. And I am <laughs> doing my best to be a good cat dad, despite my reluctance. Mm. 
Oh, man. Cats are the best. I love them. <laughs> <laughs> They're even better when you've chosen to have them. <laughs> yeah, Speaking grip experience. They choose you. They do I choose think my like sister choose chose you. me. I'll be honest. I think she chose me as a big old mark. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I know we've been chatting for a while. Is there anything you wanted to talk about that we didn't bring up? Um, not particularly. Uh, El Paso Elsewhere is available on PC and Xbox. And Strange Scaffold has put out a lot of games over the years. And we've got several more incoming, including an urban fantasy kidnapping sim where you play as a druid in suburbia who is uh, kidnapping and sacrificing multiple people a year to delay the end of the world on the behalf of a god that he doesn't know exists. So I'm make sure to follow us at Train Scaffold. Concept. Please tell me that's uh, coming to Xbox. <laughs> fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> but uh, yeah, from horror interface games to games which apparently teach children to gamble to strange uh, top-down experimental open-world games to El Paso Elsewhere, the slow-motion supernatural shooter that you most need next in your life. Uh, There's a lot of games to pick up and look for on Xbox, Switch, and PC. And you can follow at Strange Scaffold on Instagram and uh, on TikTok. Thank you so much for having me. I was just going to ask, where can people keep up to date with you and what you're doing? And you beat me to it. (laughs) <laughs> oh, man, uh, at this point is... i have I, I have it i have the instincts in me i, I know I, I know how to how to, to get right to the punch <laughs> oh zalavir it has been fantastic having you on the show we're gonna have to get you back on again sometime uh any anytime that you want to come back just hit us up and and let us know we'd, we'd love to have you back on uh everyone else stick around we're gonna take a quick break we will be back with more show uh Oliver, do you have any final words to wrap this up? Don't date the Lord of the Vampires. It will mess you up far more than it will be a happy occurrence. Good words to live by. Yep. Everyone says they want the supernatural vampire girlfriend until they have one, and then they just spend years dealing with the trauma. I want to save other people from this fate. It's just a whole (laughs) lot of bullshit you got to deal with. Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for sticking around. Another huge thanks to Zolivir Nelson for coming on and chatting about El Paso elsewhere with us. Uh, We have a party cast to take care of. Aki's here. Chris is here. Pranel's here. Andy Sperry's here. How is everyone doing? So good. Oh, it's lovely to be. Don't answer at the same time. Everyone answer at exactly the same time. That's (laughs) That's, that's right. I missed that part of the conversation. I wanted to be a part of it, so there you go. It would be great if we had <laughs> annoyed. like very annoyed. If we had like some um some like rehearsed like we're just fine, thanks. How are you? Like <laughs> in response to that. Uh, I am okay. It it I would never come through the, okay. the the Discord. Yeah, it would never work well. Yeah, it would just, like everybody would just kinda cut over each other's bits. Aki, what are you annoyed other? at? I'm still getting uh, hard and soft crashes in the game that I was having hard and soft crashes for yesterday. Oh, jeez. I've Damn. managed about 20, 21 hours uh, in this game or, since Saturday, I think it was, when I got it. Uh, this is a- which is a lot less time than I would have otherwise if it weren't for the fact that, you know, after X amount of crashes in a day, I just say, fuck it, and I'm done. <laughs> If it weren't wow. for that, I'd probably have closer to like 40 hours in this game and I'd probably be done with it. Jeez. <laughs> so irritated. That Was sucks. You're like, the, you're like the only person I know who's had massive crashing issues with that game, too. What yeah, game? Is I it? haven't run into any. Assassin's Creed. Uh, yeah, oh, okay. I, I've had three hard crash today where it just hard- literally turned off my I guess I shouldn't You're ask if they like that. Going to finally wrap up into the mic. I guess it's not worth asking if they're going to finally wrap up the narrative, huh? Oh no, this is a this is a, a, more of a spin-off game than anything. Um, now I've had three hard crashes just today, where it Jeez. turned off my Xbox altogether, and I had to turn it the fuck back on. Dang! Wow. 
And I, I've yeah, had like six or seven of those in total since Saturday. And like 16 oh, soft ones, which are when they send you back to the dashboard and you have to open the game up again. I, sounds like any belief in that game working is just a mirage. I'm the only one <laughs> who's had this kind of issue with the game. Uh, the problem is I'm also uh, one of the people reviewing it. So... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can only speak for right. my experience, not everyone yeah. else's. So eh. it's like, oh, I just, I just want to play it and finish it. And it keeps crashing. And, you know, after like 10 crashes, I'm like, fuck it. I'm tired of this. And I quit playing for the day. I mean, that's the review, isn't it? I mean, it's like, what do you think of the game? Well, I'll tell you when they fix it. Done. The thing <laughs> is, like, she's the only one running into the issues. I haven't, I have had zero crashes in the game. Did yeah. you take the PC code or did you take the, is it on console? I'm on console. No, but Aki says she's having the crashes. I'm We're both on console. On console. Well. Yeah. In that case, and I have no idea. Yeah. Also, where the, what happened to the PC code? Did you end up using it? I'll, we'll talk about it later, but <laughs> it's, it's hush, complicated. Hush, it's, it's stuff to not discuss on the show, but uh, how's, how's everyone else doing? How was your weekends? It Oh. was a time I existence. always forget that Tuesday is pretty soon after the weekend because <laughs> I have oh, a Monday man. between these two days and like a Monday undoes like everything that a weekend can do <laughs> so true <laughs> I, I finally had tacos so I'm pretty fucking happy right now today was my second Almost day late. eating tacos in a row and I'm pretty fucking stoked something You're about tacos on Tuesday yeah. yeah it's still not great when I eat cold food uh, but mm. otherwise, yeah. Oh, tacos are so good. <laughs> tacos are great. <laughs> I've wanted tacos so long. Oh, my God. Damn, I've never heard of a person liking tacos that much. Not that I'm complaining. Tacos oh, are for now, get bad. yourself down to Texas. You'll never not hear about it. <laughs> I, I, I it's make, like the thing. All y'all come down to two, Texas. We'll go have tacos. I make <laughs> two helpings of tacos every month. and. Since July 28th, I needed a root canal up until the beginning of this month when I finally got it done. I hadn't been able to eat tacos in that entire time. I wanted tacos. So, yes, yeah, so all I can think of is tacos right now. So, <laughs> we have a taco dance. Taco, 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 taco. Eat, There's your review tacos. right there. <laughs> my review is tacos are fucking fantastic everyone go make yourself some tacos tomorrow so what do you uh, think what's of that have to do about the game I want I want nothing to do about the game just go eat tacos. some goddamn tacos <laughs> exactly I had, I had so many glitches I had a lot of time to think about how badly I want tacos <laughs> actually after one day of having too many of them I decided to I, fuck it I'm just gonna make tacos and have an early dinner uh, <laughs> That's what I did yesterday. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> That's how you get it done. Talk Andy, how's things truth. going with you? <laughs> <laughs> like you just cut over it. <laughs> uh, things are good, man. Another another day. It was a good weekend. We're going to the uh, going to the arcade tomorrow. I'm oh, pretty stoked ooh. for that. I Which arcade? Arcades, yeah. Well, if it's not uh, TMI arcade, mind you. No, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's called Dorky's. It's here in Washington. Uh, Ooh, I, like I love that, that name. name. It's the pretty sweet. Yeah. Uh, they got some some cool games there. They got a, a huge, you know, classic arcade section, and they they brought in some new games too. And then uh, and then this weekend, I'm actually going to Portland uh, for the uh, retro gaming thing. I can't. What's what's the end word? For it? <laughs> retro gaming thing. Retro gaming event. <laughs> I don't know what it's called. Uh, but. Well, if you're having to, one in New York and then one in uh, in Portland here this weekend. So if you're going it's, to it's uh, not classic game arcade, sound con, is it? But no, it's like retro gaming expo okay. or something like that. Because I have a friend doing something at something called Game Sound Con. That sounds pretty cool too. I mean, we I'd like go to that if I, if I knew what it was. Yeah, I don't know what it is either. It sounds, well, yeah, almost no, all sounds the time cool. when games make sound, we're into it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I one notable exception. I like audio. I can't help it. It just sounds good to me. I mean, you other brothers can't deny how good audio sounds. <laughs> hey, my my biggest thing too is that uh, when I'm in Portland, there is a uh, there's an arcade down in Portland. I think it's called Quarter World, and they have the uh, the Enter the Gungeon light cabinet. 
So I'm gonna go go there and play that game. I don't know if you guys have nice. seen that, but it's <clears throat> really cool looking. I haven't seen Enter the like Gungeon Arcade. Is. It's a yeah, Enter the ju- Enter the Gungeon uh, Light Arcade. So it's a it's a light shooter. It's so cool to me when indies have like arcade cabs that happen. Right. That is really my one myself. Was the Killer Queen was the other one. I, I saw a Killer Queen in person. Ooh, yeah, I've yeah, only seen that at MagFest. Someone they had brought that into Mag for something, and that looked freaking awesome. That was also how I learned it existed before. He, like, I've seen the arcade. I feel like I want to say I saw the arcade cab before I knew about the game because of MagFest. Probably. Um, if you're going to play classic arcade games, then make sure to play a round of um, Wild West Cowboys of Moo Mesa for me. I will. Moo? 100%. Moo Mesa. What is that game? <laughs> well, okay, so if they have it, you know. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they gotta have it. It's a classic. They gotta have it, man. Um, they gotta it's have like it. saying it, it's like them not having, you know, Mrs. Pac Man or something. Um, no, I'm not kidding. Speaking of Mrs. Pac Man, something that I heard the other day, I need to confirm it full on that apparently they got they dropped Miss Pac Man for good, and now it's just Pac Mom. Huh? Pac Mom? Yeah. I don't know. I wouldn't yeah, be surprised for legal reasons. No, 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 no. Let's not go nuts. I didn't say woke nothing. It's <laughs> apparently know, I'm joking. <laughs> I just want to make sure. Apparently, it has something to do with the oh, like, trademark from his Pac Man being owned by ATAT Games or something. That eight oh, yeah, game, that makes the sense. Yeah. Cap company. So uh-huh, they were like, yeah. no, nah, well, they, they have to, if they own the trademark for the name, they don't want to pay them anymore. So they're like, we'll just stop calling her Miss Pac-Man. Now she's Pac-Man. <laughs> they could have just changed it to Mrs. Pac-Man. Just make them, like, officially married. <laughs> that would have been pretty freaking hilarious. <laughs> it's about time, right? Right. Like, how did this it. to work? <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, so if you didn't know, I mean, I'm sure some of us have watched cartoon shows in the 90s. They had a Ninja Turtles kind what? of... Uh, ripoff uh, called The Wild West Cowboys of Moo Mesa about these cowboys who are also cows. Oh, I remember um, that shit. Yeah. And so uh, Konami actually made an arcade game version of it, also ripping off the Ninja Turtles. It basically is like Turtles in Time, but with Wild West Cowboys of Moo Mesa. And they have like guns and stuff. This game it's, looks rad. I just looked it it's, up. Too. It's actually pretty fun, um, but I, I do make fun of it more for the absurdity of the fact that it exists than anything else. Um, but I actually I do own it because I have that um, I have that that arcade stick thing um, that Joe pointed out to me was like on a really crazy sale, <laughs> like preloaded with all those arcade games and stuff. Oh, the uh, what was it? The cap? No. When was it? I can't remember the name of it, and it's it's in the garage right now, so I can't really. <laughs> oh no, it's in my closet, but I'm not I'm not gonna dig it out. Oh, I don't so remember what it's called, but uh, we'll figure also it out. Came out on Sega Game Gear too. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, this I'm is gonna a check crazy that out. Game. I have a I'd Game Gear. This. I have a, a way to emulate Game Gear on my GameCube. So. Oh, nice. Check there you go. Out. Yeah, but cool. Yeah, I'll cool. find it. And it. I'll find it for you. I'll take pictures of it. I would ask, do, please yeah. take pictures, actually. I, uh, I played it here in Austin. They actually have it at one of the beer cades here. Oh, sick. Yeah. It's and it was def- one of the ones that's not completely destroyed. Definitely <laughs> got that Austin vibe to it, too. Yeah. There's, like, well, no you know. good arcades around me at all. The, the last good one that we had was at the one mall that got completely shut down and was demolished for Bed Bath & Beyond warehouses. And then their company went bankrupt. <laughs> so the warehouse has never happened. They tore Austin down the mall few, for nothing. We have a few places that are still kicking, but um, Einstein's and LaFun used to be the, the big ones, and they got shut down because of Scientologists. Oh, nice. They Fuck bought the yeah. Scientologists. They bought the entire strip that those things were located on and turned it into a mega church, like near the Austin, like whatever the college is called, UT. And, um, Lord. yeah, I, I have, so I have personal beef with the Scientologists and they can come after me if they want. <laughs> Bring back our arcades, you idiots. <laughs> See, if they were smart, they would have kept the arcade games in there too, you know, lure everybody in. Right? Just have like your engrams like red while playing DDR. Right? <laughs> Military recruitment. So, Jimmy, you're enjoying that game of Ninja Turtles? I sure am. That's great. Would you like to play more Ninja Turtles? Possibly for free. <laughs> Yes! <laughs> well, come this way! Learn about the space Jesus that you love so dear 
And, I don't know, fund this UFO, whatever the hell they this do. This episode's going to get shut down by Scientology. <laughs> They're going to come after us. <laughs> well, there's your title, Joe. No, Sh- I don't want to draw attention to them. <laughs> Just put like a bunch you, of asterisks like, he's like, I, I, like, I call the show someone might listen. I don't want to be, I don't want people to, I don't want the wrong people to start listening. Scientologists might listen. Oh, Maybe no. they'd be into it. <laughs> They're taking the ideas. They're like, yeah, we should have arcades. Shoot. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Finally. So, so anyway, should we get to reviews? We got a bunch of games to talk about tonight. Uh, and uh, I, I realized I did the intro wrong to this episode. So whatever. Uh-oh. I'll find a way to edit. But at the end of the show, I'll record something different. But uh, yeah, should we get to reviews? Let's do it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Cool. First game to talk about tonight is Abomination, developed by Orange Pylon Games, published by Dangan Entertainment, released September 28th on Xbox One, Series X and S, Switch for $19.99. Abomination is a roguelike monster-taming RPG. Every playthrough will create a new version of Abomination and provide a unique world with different Abomies redefined. Explore your universe, watch your Abomies bond, and battle it out as your adventure unfolds. In a way totally unique to you. Unique. Pernell, tell us about your time with Abomination. So, Abomination, the best way to describe Abomination is um, there's a thing that people like to do in Pokemon games. Specifically Pokemon games, where they feel as though the games are too easy. So what they decide to do to make them more difficult is what they've dubbed as a Nuzlocke challenge. I honestly don't know why they call it that, never did. But I was fine with that because the concept is something that's, while interesting, was something I was never going to do for reasons. But what Nuzlocking is, is when you get Pokemon, as you explore the game, there's specific rules on who you take and how you get them. But when you get those Pokemon, they're in your party until they die. And once they die, they can't be resurrected. Even though the game has mechanics to bring them back, you yourself have to accept that they're gone. And move on to your next Pokemon. You also can't catch a ton of them. They limit how many you're allowed to catch, too. So you can't just, like, go get a replacement when one dies. Um, Somebody is a big fan of Pokemon and is a big fan of the concept of Nuzlocke and decided we can make a game that's specifically tailored to this concept with the intent being that you play in this manner. And you find yourself playing a Bomby Nation, a game where light Abomies... That's the name of the animals in this game. Light Abomies are in a battle against Dark Abomies to save the Abomination. That is hysterical to me. Um, <laughs> but while it's funny because I feel like I have this dialogue a lot on this show, but it bears repeating when it becomes relevant. Uh, I wasn't really drawn to the art style in the form of stills, but when getting the game and playing around with it in execution... This game is nice. Like I like the animation of the characters. I like the the different designs that they gave to the Abomies. And quite frankly, my tune on how I feel about the design and all completely flipped on his head when I actually started playing the game proper. So if you hear, you know, Pernell from three weeks ago, man, Pommy Nation, what the hell is this crap? Punch him because he was wrong. Um, but enough about nonsense. Let's talk about the game the game's flow. Um, it is a roguelike, and at the beginning of the game, you are designated three abomies to start, or a single abomie to start the game with. Um, that abomie has, like Pokemon, they have different traits, um, up to dual typing. So you might have like a like an electric type, or sorry, a lightning type abomie, or you might have an electric slash neutral abomie. Basically, that's one of my favorite abomies that I came across named Abomi Honey. It's a living blob of honey who's got a giant mouth and wacky eyes, and his animation is just going, eek, eek, eek. It's great. Um, But they come in different traits, like water type, air type, fire type, plant type, and so on and so forth. And they have strengths and weaknesses associated with them. Um, When you start the game, like I said, you start with one Abani, and you go from screen to screen, like there's like just Look, like environments you can kind of run around in, nothing too complicated. And in this environment, you can kind of like explore and like search different objects that may appear to potentially find items you can use. Um, occasionally, you'll also find other abomi that you have to fight. But, and as you go from screen to screen, um, the things you can come across are more abomi you might have to fight, some abomi that are friendly that you can also battle just to get experience with, 
I'm not quite sure what the difference is between training ones versus you know, aggressive ones. I guess the training ones don't jump you in the street. They, you can choose to fight them or whatever for experience points. But um, in addition to that, like I described in the Nuzlocke concept, Every once in a while, you'll come across a screen where your av- your character's avatar will say, "Hey, uh, I think there's an Abami here who is friendly and might be willing to join us." And if you find that Abami on the map, they will have a quick dialogue where you try- where either you have to save them from a vicious Abami, or you have to convince them that you're not their enemy by beating them up. Um, and then once it's done, the Abami will join your party, and now you have a new Abami, and you'll just quickly build up to a maximum of six Abami in your party. But if you get any more than that, there's a bonfire you can go to where you can um, switch out ones that you want to have in your party as needed. So, how does battles work? Well, it's like Pokemon. I'm saying this, but it's not derogatory. It's just it's the easiest way to convey the concept. Um, like Pokemon, um, your Abami can have up to four moves equipped at a time. And when you go into combat... Um, you have your main Abami, and then two that are up to two that are kind of in your group that are in the background that are just kind of hanging out there that are in combat. Only your main Abami can do actual damage in, in the flow of combat, but the back Abami can ultimately take damage from certain attacks that the enemies can do. Um, while you're uh, fighting... Horror Acolyte has a question. Wants to know if when they get damaged, if they're covered by Abami care. Yes. <laughs> Yes, they I are. Like how that. did you know? How did you know? How did you know? See, you just spoiled the rest of my review. I can just wrap this up right now. <laughs> <laughs> that was a that was that's a really good joke. <laughs> oh, but yeah, like the funny part is, I wish this game did have a bomby care because when you die, <laughs> you stay dead. <laughs> A bobby oh, can keep these bobbies from dying. I guess I don't know because that's what happens. Um, that's the rub of the game when um, when you take too much damage and you don't heal it with items or whatever, and you die, you stay dead. You leave behind a tombstone, and in subsequent areas where the bombies have conversations and walk around, they will occasionally reference your the the, the dead bombie as if they were a pre- a previous friend that you lost in the adventure, which is actually kind of nice. In fact, I kind of like the conversations that they have in general, because as you go from screen to screen, your bombies will have a dialogue between each other. A little, just nothing, but nothing complicated, nothing deep. Just something to say, hey, these bombies have personalities, and they're exchanging them with each other. Now, the downside to that, however, is that every time you cross the screens, if it's the exact same bombie in your party, they will have the exact same conversation. So, that can get old. But every once in a while, you'll see something new, and you go, oh, my bombies are having friendly conversations with each other and bonding. That's cool. Um, something worth noting that's pretty cool about this game? Well, two things. One is the obvious thing that I didn't say earlier, which is that you can equip items to the Abami that they can uh, boost their stats or uh, increase their defense versus certain typings or increase their damage of specific attacks or types of attacks. Um, but in addition to that, something that I really found cool about this game is the fact that um, when you have an attack that you establish that you want to hit another enemy with, it displays all the calculations on the screen. So if you've played Pokemon and you've been like, okay, I know this Pokemon has this attack power and this is a base 70 physical attack of the water type and my Pokemon is a water type which gives it stab and I attack this fire type, I'll do two times damage plus 1.5 damage because of my stab bonus, you'll go through the rigmarole and drive yourself freaking crazy. Unless you have a stab calculator, but by that point yeah, you're knee deep in Pokemonix. I've been there, so I'm not even knocking it. I get it. However, not everybody wants to deal with that. Sometimes you just want to know how much damn damage your attack's going to do. And this game outright shows you to the letter. It shows you how much is going to get nullified, how much is going to get buffed by your items, your, your abilities. Abilities being like traits that the Abomies can have that can result in different effects. Um, but it'll take all those things into account. It'll list them all on the right side of the screen, and it'll flat out say, you're going to do 50 damage if you use its attack. You'll do 2 damage, so you probably don't want to do that. And to be quite frank, I kind of appreciate that, not just because it takes all the guesswork out, but because of the fact that due to the idea that you will have permadeath on your Abomies, it's pretty important to get your crap right. <laughs> In a battle, because you make a mistake, you're going to get screwed. Now, you could also be a Purnell, 
who just decides to come turn the damn game off when he loses in the bombing and just start it back up because the game doesn't <laughs> save immediately when they die because I'm an asshole like that. But eventually when I stop being enough of a coward to ask the experience it to the fullest, I'll let my Abami die in good faith. They did their job. But sometimes, I mean, you will get surprised. You'll fight an Abami. It's like, okay, he's a, a lightning air type. I should be okay putting this guy in there. And he's like, no, sucker. Got this attack. You didn't see it coming. And then you just die to the forex damage to your salsa salsa. Uh, freaking bull crap. Um, but the game is fun. Um, and the, thing, the only thing about it that it's kind of weird is that um, it is like bare bones in the sense of like the adventure part, mind you. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm going to make another Pokemon comparison here. Um, in Pokemon games, they give you a fair bit of busy work in between the actual things you're trying to do. Because due to the fact that you're always trying to catch like a gajillion Pokemon, you're going to be rubbing your way through the grass, trying to find the right ones and throwing the Pokeballs at it. You'll be looking for things like TMs and hidden items on the map. Um, and you get the ability that you go to different places. This game kind of goes light on all those things. Um, you can find items on the ground, but they're not hard to spot. You see a dusty shard on the ground, go pick it up. Um, there's not... The closest I've seen that comes to like in the HM is that when you beat bosses, sometimes you get the ability to remove smoke that might be blocking a path you could have taken, so you'll go back and remove the smoke, which gives you access to another path to take. But... There's not a lot of exploration you're going to be doing. You're literally going from screen to screen, fighting the abomies you want to fight, fighting the abomies they force you to fight, getting your new abomies when the game tells you can collect one, and just seeing how far you can get. Quite frankly, though, that's fine, because what I like most about these games is the battling anyway, so I don't really need all the busy work. I got tired of that a little ways back in some respect. <laughs> I like beating things up with other things. And... uh as far as like the roguelike part, if you die and lose all your Obam, Obam, Obam God darn it, that darn joke came back. Um, <laughs> and lose all your Abamis, you'll start anew with a new starting Abami, and you'll branch out forward. However, you can spend currency that you acquired during the game in a menu on the, on the main screen to buy new Abami that can show up during the game proper, new items that can show up in the game proper, and new areas that can show up in the game as well. So you are ultimately expanding more of what you're capable of seeing as you play the game. One last thing I should probably say is that um, I did mention a bunch of screens you can go to where you go to the screen and you fight monsters or other things like that. But the other type of screen you can generally come across is a, a town. You'll come across those frequently, actually. And the town is basically just a place where you'll see a few Obami that you can talk to that might give you some tips. Some will just give you flavor text. Um, you will be able to purchase items in these towns, um, items that you can use to equip your Abami with, or items that can heal them in combat or outside of combat. And there's also a place where you can kind of rest up and get your HP back, or also just to, um, like I said, try to swap Obami out with others in your, in your back group. It's also a good place to freaking grow because if you go out into the field, fight a guy, he beats the snot out of you, you weren't expecting that, but you luck out and you survive the battle just barely, you'll get your experience because you can just go right back to town, have to hear that conversation again, but whatever. But go back to town, stay in the amp, stay in the campfire, get all your HP back and try again. So they give you some outs to try to get a little better, even if you don't want to be a safe scum jerk like me. And, um, uh, quite frankly, this game surprised me. I think it's fun. It's an enjoyable game. They give you a lot of stats to crunch over, a lot of items to crunch over. They take all the guesswork out of the combat stats and just let you play it to the fullest. Uh, just a straight up, you know, monster versus a monster battler. Oh, well, it clocks in at nineteen ninety nine. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's worth it. I think this is honestly a buy it game. Cool. All right, moving also, on. Also, get health care. Yeah, <laughs> we need it. Universal health care for all, please. Uh, next game, Whisker Squadron Survivor, developed and published by Flipfly, uh, released August 21st on Steam for $14.99, a cosmic roguelite on-rail shooter with wild 30-minute runs that will take your feline flight crew to thrilling new heights with each randomized adventure. Your plan is simple, wreak vengeance on the swarm and try to survive. Andy, tell us about your time with Whisker Squadron Survivor. Oh, yeah, it's my turn now, boys. Uh, Whisker <laughs> Squadron Survivor, as you said, is a cosmic on-rail shooter roguelike. Oh, it's a mouthful. Uh, basically, think like Star Fox with rogue elements and cats, which is really cool, too. Everybody loves cats. So uh, 
you want to choose from, uh, so basically you choose from a couple different space cat pilots, spacecrafts, weapons. Uh, each of them have their own play style. And then you fly and fight your way through like blocky neon style levels. It's, they all they all look really, really cool. Um, the ships have their own uh, health bar or hull and an energy bar that slowly depletes as you boost or like fire your main weapons. And so... And so, like, you can't really, like, spam boost through each, like, zone and things, and you can't really spam fire rate, you know, the whole time. You gotta, you gotta kind of be smart about it, too. You can upgrade that, too, but I'll, I'll, I'll get into that in a second. Um, you go through and you, uh, you fight wild enemies, you know, that come down from the sky, you know, or, or come down from below you. Uh, they like scarabs. There's, like, these laser turrets that spin around. There's lar- larva bombs, you know, that, jump up and explode next to your ship uh little spike heads they're like they're like little snakes that you know fly past you and then turn around and shoot lasers at you they're pretty cool and then there's also uh like occasional boss type enemies too um that are just really hard the bosses were really interesting too in this game too because if you if you don't beat one in a zone it shows up in the next zone or another boss shows up in the next zone and so it's it's like really smart to kind of beat the boss, but you're also trying to collect things at the same time too. I don't know. It was it was kind of interesting, but just added like you know an extra. So do you like, mean you could like run into two bosses at the same time? No, not two bosses at the same time. No, oh, it'd be okay. like it'd be like the the one boss you know like I was fighting, and then I I like wouldn't beat it you know in the in the time frame or so, and then I'd make it to the next zone, and then either usually like the same boss would appear, but every once in a while like a different boss would appear too you know keep it going, but that was all kind of random too. Um, every time you destroy an enemy, um, you know, and these are a lot kind of like robotic looking enemies too. They're they're pretty neat design you know. Um, the whole game has kind of this like neon like synth wave you know feel to it it's really neat uh, but every time you destroy an enemy they release scrap which uh you pick up and you use that scrap to level up your ship in the game um depending on you know how much is collected you know each level it's a little bit a little bit more each time kind of thing um some of the upgrades are like uh like you can get chain lightning which is like zaps all the enemies like around other enemies um, increase the fire rate or the, your defense, uh, missile upgrades. Um, there was like an energy roll deflector, which was really neat. Found myself saying, do a barrel roll every time it happened too. I thought it was awesome. <laughs> um, and then everything besides the first level, the first pilot weapon, and you get like a, a secondary weapon too, like a, like a missile, like a heat seeking missile or, uh, or there was one that was like a big bomb too. Um, everything needs to be unlocked in the game. So you start off with like some basic stuff, you know, um, you collect this, uh, this stuff called VP or victory points, um, which is basically your currency. And then, you know, you unlock everything with victory points too. Um, you get that by destroying enemies or like keeping a high combo meter going, you know, you keep your combo going, you don't get hit, you know, you don't, you don't run out of time in between killing enemies. Like you get more VP. And then there's there's a couple other ways you can get that too, which is really neat. Uh, there's like different characters that will give you you know different uh, different abilities, but you can also get one that is like plus ten percent chance of VP. Um, there's also mods for each level too, which makes the gameplay like way harder, um, and uh, also gives you like plus plus ten percent more VP every time you earn it too, which is really neat. Um, mods were, like I said, pretty difficult, you know, um, and you unlock them across all the levels, you know, when you unlock them, uh, there was some that was like, if you, one's called fatal collision, like if you run into a wall or run into an enemy or anything, like it just ends your run like right there, you know, which was kind of devastating. Um, there's one that like increases the, the enemy projectile speed. Um, one that starts you off like without a shield or anything. Um, or one that like increases your damage, but also like increases enemy damage. So a couple things that made things a little more difficult, but also, you know, a little bit more fun, you know, for the overall game. Um, and then there's also accessibility options, which like decrease the difficulty too, which was nice. So if it's too fast or too insane for you, you can, uh, reduce the game speed. So make it a little bit slower. I already felt like it was, you know, the first two or three zones were like a little bit slow you know there's not a ton of enemies coming at you but i can see how you know once things start picking up people freak out 
And then there was also like reducing incoming damage too, which was nice. So um, currently there are three main missions. So you have like each of your three main levels and then there's 10 zones in each mission too. And so, like you said, a run lasts uh, up to about 30 minutes or so. It depends, you know, I, you know, it, it, it all kind of depends on how you play. You know, you can speed through levels too and attack everything, you know, and be really, really good, you know, and stuff. Or you can turn down your incoming damage and, uh, you know, go way faster. Or you can end it in a minute, you know, by crashing into everything. Uh, <laughs> all those things have happened to me. So at, uh, it's all like enemies are all like procedurally generated. You know, the scene is all procedurally generated. There's like bonus levels that show up every once in a while too. And the company has, uh, what's the company name? Uh, Flip, Flip Fly LLC. They have uh, a couple other games that they're working on, but it's it's like the levels that you unlock, you know, like in another level are references to their other games, which I thought was really neat too. That's interesting. So, yeah, it was it was it was pretty fun. Uh, I was actually watching a, a friend play the game too, and and he unlocked one of the bonus levels, and it was like it was like race, you know. They have another game called like Race the Sun, and uh, it was like race, you know, race the ship or something like that it was some clever wording on it too and he was like oh no i have to i have to get all the way to the end and i was i was in his chat just like no man like you're fine just like enjoy the level you know so (laughs) it was pretty interesting but uh i would say overall like i i really enjoyed the gameplay like the concept of it is like not anything really new to me you know I've, i've played on rail shooters i've played a lot of roguelites you know but i've i've never really played one like you know mashed up together so that was neat um, I felt like the controls were, were perfect. Like they, I jumped into it and I didn't have to like change any of the controls, you know, really there are the options to change controls, you know, for flight patterns, but, but it felt really okay. smooth. Everything like, you know, moved around perfectly. You know, I was able to do barrel rolls and all that stuff too. So that was nice. Um, and then there's not like a whole lot of buttons too. There's like two extra buttons, you know, for your missiles and like for your main fire weapon, you know, so. So it's like really easy to like jump in and kind of like you know start playing. So very cool. But, uh, I do have a question though. Yeah. What did you think of the music? The music I thought was good at points, um, but it I felt like it got a little repetitive, honestly. Oh, okay. Like it was because... it was it was cool. It was kind of like a rock, you know, like had kind of like a rock synth wave to it, you know. I felt like, um, but I, I mean, I played a lot of this game, so I was listening to it over and over again, but. I was like, I, I I like it, but there's there's not a lot of differences, I would say, to it. Yeah, I could see that being the case. Yeah, but I mean, overall, I, I felt like everything else in the game was fantastic. You know, even the music is really good. You know, I, I don't say that as like the music is not good. I just say that as like, you know, I listened to however many tracks there are and I enjoyed every time I listened to them. But it was like, oh, OK, like if they threw a curveball at me and threw like metal in there, you know, or like a a cool jazz song or something like that, I would have been like, oh, all right, the music's <laughs> pretty wild, you know? So, but yeah, I thought it was a great game. But go ahead cool. and ask your question, man. Joe, it's Me all or you. Purnell. I didn't, I didn't you. know if uh, Purnell had any other questions. <laughs> it could be either. <laughs> ask me your famous question and I'll, I'll give you my closing statement after. The game is fourteen ninety nine. What are your thoughts on Whisker Squadron Survivor? My thoughts overall would be to get it because it is a great game. It is still in early access, which, uh, I, dude, I always love early access games because I feel like the company just like, you know, I want a full game, but also I feel like the company is tailoring to like the people who are actually going to get it and play it. You know what I mean? Um, and for how much content's there, I would definitely say fourteen ninety nine is is worth it. You know, I, I recommend it. Pick it up. Cool. All right. Well, uh, Andy, that is it for you. We will let you get going so you can attend to your family. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate you guys. Always a pleasure having you on. Uh, do you have, have any, a good night. Any final words before we let you get going? Um, play some games and enjoy life and, uh, you know, take a shot or do something. Take a shower. Do something fun with your life. <laughs> take a shower. <laughs> <laughs> wash your no, thank ass. Thank you, guys. Thanks for, yeah, wash your ass, dude. Thanks for letting me on here. I appreciate you guys. <laughs> have a good a one. Pleasure. All right, later, guys. All right, next up is Knight vs. Giant, The Broken Excalibur, developed by Gambier Studio, published by P-Cube, released October 5th on Xbox Series X and S, Switch, PS5, and PC for $19.99. Step into the greaves of King Arthur in this fantasy action roguelite and wield the broken Excalibur in a quest to rescue the scattered citizens of Camelot. 
vanquish the calamitous void giant and escape from the astral dimension once and for all. Chris, tell us about your time with Knight vs. Giant, the Broken Excalibur. Okay, so Knight vs. Giant. Um, this is uh, very much like, okay, so <laughs> here's the thing. I, I bought Hades, but I have not played it myself. But, uh, you know, that's that's the story for at least a, a three digit amount of um, of games I have on the switch. Um, but I have seen it played and this does seem pretty kind of going for the same idea. So this is a um, an action roguelite in that you go into, you know, you traverse into the unknown procedurally generated, of course, and um you know, fight through bosses and regular enemies and collect materials, treasures, rescue people, um, and then, of course, inevitably uh, perish, upon which you are resurrected at the at the hub where um, you can now kind of build, talk to people, you know, um, build up your characters so that you can go into the um, into the dungeon a little bit stronger and with more, um, you know, with more at your disposal. Uh, so that's like the general kind of gameplay loop of it. So the story of it is that uh, due to some un- unsaid mistake by uh, by the famous Merlin, who uh, sounds like he's voiced by Brian Blessed in this game, which is pretty great. Um, but yeah, he's got this... Uh, there's, there's some voice acting in this game. Um, it's kind of like story scenes are voice acted, but like uh, the rest of it is, you know, just regular text. Anyways, Merlin, um, uh, I guess King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table have all gone to the, uh, to like some place, the, uh, the void or whatever, uh, to seek the Holy Grail and to defeat, um, a void giant who, uh, you know, and yeah, basically the Knights of the Round Table all get exploded by, um, the Holy Grail through a mishap, um, and King Arthur gets murdered by the void giant, womp womp, um, but using his magic, Merlin is able to conjure kind of like kind of like the badass ghost of King Arthur. Like he doesn't have a face. It's, it looks like just a suit of armor with just, you know, blackness inside. Um, but, you know, he still speaks like King Arthur and everybody recognizes him as, as such. So you've got a um, you've got a very annoyed King Arthur who uh, doesn't like the idea that he has died and uh, is, in fact, now on a mission, um, basically now, you know, Camelot is hurtling, hurtling through space uh, in this kind of weird little outer space island with three distinct parts, uh, a forest, a desert, and a volcano. And Arthur must travel to each of these and destroy a giant within uh, in order to keep the void giant from resurrecting. Um, <laughs> so... Anyway, yeah, it's classic King Arthur. It's it's the same thing you'd read in like the old Arthurian legends um, from a thousand years ago. I don't need to paraphrase all that. Um, but anyway, part of it is that uh, his sword is broken. Excalibur is shattered it to the hilt, and uh, so he doesn't have that to use. Instead, what has happened is that uh, the spirits of the Knights of the Round Table, starting with Lancelot and Bors. Uh, now occupy these statues that uh, sit in the Camelot Town Square, and you can actually assign uh, the ghostly version of one of their weapons to be Excalibur in its place. So, for instance, Lancelot's sword is a um, is a slower sword, but it's more balanced and does more damage, whereas Boar's is more of a, a speed and distance kind of guy. And from each of these statues, you can get one weapon or, and one skill. Uh, the skill is assigned to the X button, and like for Lancelot, it's a lightning attack, and for Boars, it's a spinning blade attack kind of thing. And uh, you kind of mix and match them um, for Arthur, and they, uh, as you go into the stages and fight enemies and such, you get uh, gold and purple stuff, and Sunny D, and um, <laughs> and your your weapons and skills that you use will level up, um, but. In order to make them stronger, you have to unlock the blacksmith and have him work on Excalibur. Um, so not only do you need to pay money to get your uh, sword skills, your sword and skill, uh, you know, um, built up, but you also have to have earned the experience points to do so as well. And that goes for any of the weapons. So if you have a particular loadout that you like, it might be worth it to just stick with that and keep leveling it up. Um, within the dungeon... 
we've got a whole bunch of different little bonuses and kickbacks and um, and kickflips and all that other good stuff that you can add to Arthur for that particular game. And of course, they will leave uh, once you get uh, killed. And so these things are like uh, higher critical damage chance, uh, or it'll be something like if you use your roll attack, because of course this game has a roll attack. It's it's a modern game. It has to have a roll attack. Um, a roll dodge, rather. But you can turn the roll dodge into a roll attack that stuns enemies. So uh, these things, uh, like any kind of game like this, uh, you know, they pop up from time to time. Uh, every time there's a room full of enemies, you'll get something for it, uh, whether it's just gold and purple stuff, or whether it's... Uh, you know, like an actual altar that you can, um, it'll randomly select three skills and you can choose which one you want to improve your character. Um, so yeah, it's really all about rolling and slashing and, and skilling your way through all the rooms to get to the bosses. The bosses are, uh, so there's, there's a boss on each level. There's two levels in each world. So it's like total of six levels basically. And, um, in the first level, you'll have a mid-boss that's pretty big. Um, <clears throat> like, they actually have to stretch out the camera a little bit to get them all in there. Uh, but then, when you get to the second boss in uh, in one of the worlds, that's the giant, and it actually is a giant. You are going to be stabbing the toe of, like, this big giant-ass thing. And, uh, and it attacks by, you know... You'll see it broadcast its attacks kind of like MMO style. Like, it'll draw a circle on the ground. Like, that's where you need to get away from because that's where the attack's going to happen. Um... The bosses each have a set of moves that, you know, you'll learn as you continue to, uh, you know, continue to challenge them. But eventually you'll, um, you know, like I said, you can get your passives, your loadout, all kind of improved to the point where you have a much easier start. And yeah, if you get lucky with the dice, then you can make it all the way to the final boss, which I did uh, and didn't beat him. But that's okay. (laughs) I I will say, though, that I did get to the final stage once and actually had the game lock up on me. So that was that was annoying. Yeah, it was uh, one of the enemies became unkillable, like it landed into this kind of inaccessible area um, that I guess it broke through the invisible wall. So I couldn't kill it and um, or something. I don't know. And uh, you can't leave the room until all the enemies are dead. So and there was passive you know traps in the in the room that could kill me so i just let them kill me even though there is a option in the pause menu to just simply go back to the town but still that was a bummer and it that was on my first day too so (laughs) it took me another couple days to get to that point again but uh the fortunate thing is this game is really fun it's uh it's fast and it's snappy um the combat feels great uh definitely reminds me of of uh cat quest more than anything um not only for the cartoony look of it, like it's very uh, cell shade a- or you know cell animated uh, looking, but also just for the fact that like it's roll attack and do a skill, like that's exactly what Cat Quest was. Um, so it's I kind love of Cat Quest too. Oh, me too, me too. Yeah, that's that's not a knock. I, I love Cat Quest a lot. In fact, I hundred percented it. So and nice. uh, I never I never beat the sequel, but I will at some point. But anyways. Uh, so yeah, this kind of reminds me of that in that it's fast and fun and uh, doesn't take itself seriously at all. Uh, it I do like that it mixes this kind of Arthurian, like, you know, ancient prose of like, you know, betwixt the dark firmament, uh, you know, lies the arcane, <laughs> you know, manifestations of... And then at some point, you know, Merlin calls something no biggie. And then he then he walks it back and says, actually, yes, Biggie, because, you know, <laughs> like, so this game is silly and goofy, nice. but also, you know, epic and, and, and fun. Um, ultimately, I think that's what the game's about. It's just it's a very fun roguelite. Like, it doesn't feel frustrating. Um, you know, if you if you have a bad loadout and get killed by a boss, you're just kind of like, well, there's all this stuff that I can now do because I got this gold and this purple stuff. Well, the purple stuff doesn't last outside of the dungeon. It is literally purple stuff, by the way. It's it's blobs of purple. You use them in in the dungeon uh, at shops that are there to uh, to purchase um, different kinds of things to improve yourself. But they don't they they don't follow you outside the dungeon. But the gold does, and so that's that's what you want. Um, but yeah, well, like speaking it's, of purchasing, this game yeah. clocks in at twenty mm-hmm. bucks. Should people purchase it? 
Yeah, this is a buy it for me. Um, there's a couple of performance issues. Like I said, the room did freeze up on me. Sometimes uh, the game will stop to load something, uh, which will cause some jitters in the action. Uh, but it never quite slows down at any consistent tick. So it's more or less like just if the, the CPU kind of gets overwhelmed and it'll it'll jitter once or twice and you'll be back in action. So, uh, hey, you know, that's uh, that's not too bad. And like I said, the... Um, the action is really, really fun and satisfying. Uh, it doesn't take itself seriously, and you will be playing this over and over and over again. So, yeah, it's it's a solid buy it from me. Cool. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Next up, Mechs v Kaijus, developed by Double Punch, published by Jandusoft, released September 28th on Xbox One, Series X and S, Switch, PS4, PS5 for $12.99. In Mechs v Kaijus, you take on the role of the commander of a powerful mech squadron. Jump your mechs out of the defense wall and control them on the battlefield. Strategically place towers and traps on the battlefield in tactical mode to create an impenetrable defense. Use power do- powerful skills and deploy support units. Create huge armies with factories. Uh, Pernell, tell us about your time with Mechs v Kaijus. Mechs v Kaijus will get your blood pressure up. That's a fact. Um... This is a tower defense game, but unlike some tower defense games where you're probably used to them being like fairly, I won't call them light, but methodical in the sense that you kind of can plan your moves out and kind of pace yourself. You ain't doing that in this game because they send waves at you hard. It's pretty brutal of a game. And I mean that in a good way in a sense, too. Just also knowing that in some respects, you might find yourself not wanting that. Um, But the general idea here is... You are protecting areas of Pokio. Yeah, I said Pokio. Um, kind of funny after talking about a game that reminded me of Pokemon, but I digress. Uh, <laughs> so you're protecting Pokio from this kaiju invasion. And what ends up happening typically is that you will find yourself having to defend a wall or some structures, typically, from kaiju attack. And at the core of your defense, well, let me rephrase that because not your core, but you'll use it a lot, is... <laughs> Three mechs or so that will be uh, hanging out on the wall, firing bullets. That your choice, by the way, because you're controlling the bullets of one of those mechs, and the other two mechs are support mechs that kind of fire on their own based on where they believe they need to shoot bullets to. But you'll be firing bullets at these creatures that are coming from the side of the screen to the encroaching uh, your wall in hopes of killing them in advance. But if that was all you had, you'd be fucked because there is literally no way you can defeat this army with just those three mechs. But fortunately, this is a tower defense game, not a mech defense game. So you are also making use of a multitude of different defense options that you can drop on the, onto the field to halt or completely stop in the advance of the crazy horde of creatures that are coming your way. Examples being things like uh, platelets of saws that can be just airdropped on the ground. And then when it lands, they'll create a buzzsaw effect that will slow enemies down and do damage to them. Um, Tesla coils, flamethrowers, rocket launchers, tank dispensers, all sorts of things that you'll be able to eventually start to deploy onto the field. Of course, you don't start out with all those things because obviously there's a tech tree in this thing that eventually advance your way up to. Um, but you'll be placing things out using resources that you obtain in during the combat session is money, essentially. Um, every time you kill Kaiji, you'll get money and then you can press a button to slow down time and allow you to place things you know, methodically as best you can in the wave and, and the raging onslaught of enemies that are coming your way. In addition to the, the towers you can place down and the mechs themselves, you can also get objects you can actually use when they've charged up that can kind of help tilt the tide of battle too, like such as like droids that can like attack you know, as anti areas to fight down like jerk bag bats or a mini mechs that will you know rush the battlefield on your behalf, missiles you can deploy on the from the sky, um like strike forces and what have you. Um at the end of a while, oh, also one thing, the most important thing you mentioned in the description, the mechs themselves do not have to actually stay on the wall. Um, you can also make on certain levels, you can have them actually jump out of the mech and not jump out of the mech, but jump off the wall and place themselves into the field itself. Now, this has mixed benefits and disadvantages as well. The benefit is that you get your mech closer to the action, which means their bullets are going to hit enemies that are farther away from the wall if you need them to. They can get into the thick of it. The downside, of course, is that now the mech is vulnerable to enemy attack. It can take damage. 
And when a mech takes damage, it needs to be repaired after you beat a level using money that you earn that you want to preferably use to upgrade your mechs themselves. But if you got to spend it to you know repair the mech, that kind of slows your advances. Now, fortunately, though, the game does allow you to replay stages to kind of grind out some cash. And I get the sense that you will likely have to do that. I was doing it because I felt like I wanted to, but I can't imagine playing through this game without redoing stages. It just seems impossible. It also helps that when you beat levels with three stars, because you know that's my favorite mechanic in the game, is the stars, um, you unlock <laughs> bonus objectives for stages, which you can use to, you know, of course, give yourself a new challenge on old levels, but also to earn more money and more research points to advance your research and I didn't even mention the research tree. I only mentioned the... Um, I didn't mention it in Tough at all. I was going to all that then. Um, you get research points and the money. Um, the mech improvements that you can do called them with the money. I mentioned how you can repair the mech, but you can also increase the firepower of a mech, like the it, it damage the bullets will do, things of that nature for the assistant mechs. For the mech that you personally control, you can upgrade all those things, but you can also switch different types of ammo to like piercing ammo versus, you know, ranged ammo. You can increase the shield capacity of the wall itself so it can take more damage before the shield comes down. But the research points you get, that's the sweet meat and potatoes of this game because there's a really large tech tree that you can spend those points on to slowly advance your way up to having a powerhouse of an army. And it's going to feel good when you start going back to levels that gave you trouble before. Now you're just like mud stomping all over them because, like I said, until you get to the point where you are doing that, this game is very frantic. You will find yourself feeling overwhelmed sometimes, but then be surprised when you still get a two or three star rating on the level because you somehow managed to pull it out of your butt. That's fine. That's (laughs) Mech versus Kaiju's in a nutshell. It's a lot of fun, honestly. I haven't played a tower defense game of any sort in a long time. But I've always been fond of them ever since the Pixel Junk games. And I feel like this does a great job of getting me back into the fold, albeit not in a relaxed manner, as I mentioned earlier. Um, Blood, sweat, and tears, baby. But it's a fun time. And one that I hope people don't let sleep on their radars, though I will say, I'm not sure why it happened, but one hilarious glitch that I had was when I first booted the game up and went into the mech uh, upgrade menu, nothing was in English. Like, I didn't change the settings or nothing, just for some reason, that specific menu was not in English. I did one mission, came back out, and never had that problem again. It was just this hmm. weird thing. It was like, I have no idea what this is that I'm upgrading, but I guess I'll spend some money on it, whatever. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was just ridiculous. But after that one session, it, after that one moment, it never happened again. But I wanted to mention it because I thought it was funny. Um, but yeah, I think the game is good. It's a solid time. Um, just prepare to be stressed out. But that's the nature of the beast, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, well, the of the kaiju. Clocks in at twelve ninety nine. What are your thoughts? Another solid buy. I know I'm a freak. That means I'm due for a bad game. Well, I'll have to find you one. <laughs> we have this game. You're picking earwax out of your ears. You got to do it before the time runs out, and you're going to use it to build a statue. That's your game. Cornell's just going to be sitting around one day playing Pump It Up or something and get a text that says, I got a shitty one. <laughs> <laughs> Gilson B. Pontes has released a new one. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you a bad enough dude to suffer like so? To suffer like G did? Oh, geez. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Next game to talk about is Sunshine Manor, developed by Fossil Games, published by Hound Pick Games, released October 6th on Xbox One, Series X and S, Switch, PS4, PS5 for $7.99. Ada is a reluctant adventurer who accepts the challenge to spend a night in the infamous haunted Sunshine Manor and encounters ghosts, demons, and other blood-soaked tours along with quirky characters, unique challenges, and a cute but eerie atmosphere. Aki, what is going on in Sunshine Manor? Oh, okay. So, in this, uh, you and some friends have gone trick-or-treating and you decide to visit this old manor that was the Sunshine Manor, named after the uh, famous TV show in universe, uh, the Sunshine Manor, actually, I think was the name of the show, um, which was a kid's TV show. And uh, immediately upon entering, both of your friends are kidnapped by this vampire monster thingy. 
and it tries to capture you, but you're able to blast it back with a psychic blast. You're like, nope, fuck this. I want to go home uh, immediately. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You can't get out, though. So, well, I guess it's time to figure out how to get the fuck up out this bitch and leave my two friends uh, for dead because, you know, they got caught. It ain't my problem anymore. Uh, (laughs) And yeah, so you very quickly meet a ghost and the ghost is like, hey, you need to help these uh, other ghosts that are here. And by helping us all, you'll be able to get the fuck out of this bit. You're like, cool. okay, sounds like a plan. So you go and you meet uh, another ghost and you have to do a little quest for them to find something or do something they need in order for them to even be willing to listen to you. Tell them that they're dead, uh, in which case then they remember a little bit of what happened right before they died, and they're like, oh shit, I'm fucking dead. Oh no, uh, <laughs> you need to free me. I'm trapped here. And then they bring you into a little small dungeon. Um, sometimes it, it, the first one is like an alteration of the actual manner itself, and then all the other ones after that are their own separate, completely different areas. Um, and in those, you have to figure out how to free them, basically. They'll, they'll more or less tell you what you need to do, and then you just have to figure out the steps to do it. Uh, like in the first one, I had to convince uh, something to give me a key to free the guy, and it was like, oh, okay, we'll go get me this food that I like, this little shithead stole it from me and is eating it so go get it and so you have to go and basically play catch with this monster until you're able to get the meat from him and that's there there's one mini game done voila more or less (laughs) and it's like none of the other ones are like that there each one is its own little different thing um the game doesn't take very long realistically uh if you're gonna spend uh, a lot of time in this game, it's uh, going for one very specific uh, achievement. Uh, there is an achievement for getting uh, basically diaries, which you only get if you beat up the vampire and then exit the room before the vampire disappears. Uh, at that point, he will drop a uh, old... Uh, God, I don't even know what it is... Uh, like in old, old movies where they were like, oh, yeah, here's this like giant cassette tape, more or less. It's not it's not an eight track. It's like the old, old giant things um, that you find in like spy movies and shit. Uh, but they're all diary recordings, basically, of Mr. Sunshine um, from way back when. And you have to find all of those. The thing just shows up at random and you have to be in the right room when it shows up for it to go after you so you can attack it otherwise it leaves that room too so it's like that that's the only achievement that really makes this game take any period of time otherwise this game is beatable in like an hour or two Mm. Uh, it's it's a very short game there's only four ghosts to help and the building isn't particularly big so yeah any more than that and i would spoil other solutions or the story so that's all i have to say about that <laughs> well it's an eight dollar game what do you what do you have to say about that uh i'm very for it there is one warning i have for any achievement hunters right now there are currently two broken achievements they don't seem to have fixed them quite yet uh two of the story achievements are just broken they don't pop for some reason uh you let them know that they were broke so hopefully that gets fixed soonishly. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, it's a it's a good, fast little quick game. It's kind of cute. Uh, it's not for children because they do cuss in the game uh, a number of times. So, yeah, otherwise, it's great. Yeah, have fun. Cool. All right. One final game to talk about tonight is called Project Blue, developed by Toggle Switch and Franken GFX. Published by 8-Bit Legit, released October 6th on Xbox One, Series X and S and Switch for $9.99. 
Also available on the NES from 8-Bit Legit and Mega Cat Studios for $39.99, $49.99 wow. with the box and manual. Put your skill, wits, and reflexes to the test as you jump, swim, and blast your way through four massive areas in this exciting new action platformer. Chris, tell us about your time with Project Blue. Okay, so Project Blue is a... Um, oh, excuse me, I sneezed right before unmuting the mic, so now I'm, I'm suffering. Um... <laughs> And then Cricket came out and squeaked at me, and I was like, I wasn't yelling at you, I was just sneezing. <laughs> anyway, um, Cricket is one of my cats, by the way. I don't actually have a pet Cricket. <laughs> um, but anyways, so yeah, Project Blue. This is a new NES game, which we always love to see those. Um, you know, as you know, I'm a fan of the NES bat from back in the day. Um, and yeah, this one is pretty cool. It is a um, kind of a puzzle platformer. Um, it sort of it's basically a single room um, puzzle platformer, but the way that they're all interconnected kind of gives it that sense of it being, you know, all one type of thing rather than, you know, room one, 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 two, one, three, you know, things like that. Um, think of it as like kind of like the Zelda style of scrolling. You know, as soon as you uh, leave the uh, the screen, it just kind of pops over and then you're now in the next screen. Um and yeah, you basically have two buttons. One of them jumps, one of them shoots. That's uh, that's all we need. And uh, you basically run your guy around, and uh, some of the enemies are shootable, some are not. Um, you must dodge them and, uh, and, and shoot them if possible. Um, you have floating uh, scent signs that basically act like Mario coins. If you collect enough of them, you get a one-up. Um, in fact, this really does kind of feel like Mario with a gun, um, which is... Well, we've all been wanting this whole time. <laughs> um, but uh, anyways, yeah, so um, there's not much story in the actual game. However, they did provide as the uh, pretty much the only real uh, thing that you get in the game on the Switch is is the instruction book and your choice of borders. Um, and yeah, the instruction book actually does paint this kind of uh, this kind of uh, dystopian, like you know, this corporation Omni, whatever Om- Omnicore that runs like the entire world, and um, you know, it's like four um, chairmen, as it were, um, all died long ago, and their brains have now been put into battle tanks and things like that, a battle helicopter, and so those uh, kind of serve as the bosses of the game. Uh, so you have to defeat basically robotic capitalists. Um, it's pretty fun as far as that goes. Like I said, you don't really get that sense in the game. A little bit of environmental um, stuff there, like you know you do see uh, Omnicore and stuff like that on in the um, in the game's decorations and stuff. And by the way, speaking of decorations, backgrounds on this game look really cool. Um, excellent use of like. Um, using all of the, uh, cause this was built actually, you know, like an NES game. So it, it's within the limitations of an NES game. And that's why they have an actual NES cart. So it is worth it to point out that the, um, uh, that the backgrounds and graphics in general, uh, look really cool. Um, the backgrounds very nice and, um, you know, they're a little, d- no, I wouldn't say dark actually. And actually the later levels are much brighter, but like, you know, they're very detailed and, um, the lighting is used to good effect um, to kind of, you know, you uh, stay within the limits as far as that goes. Your character is very small um, and kind of has a little bit of a floatiness, a, a bit of a momentum to him. Um, I couldn't put my finger on exactly what kind of uh, on exactly which game is like that. Uh, actually, the Cyber Citizen um Power Man, whatever games that I reviewed last time, uh, <laughs> actually kind of remind the first game reminded me of this a little bit, but it's not quite so extreme. Um, but yeah, it's really, um, like I said, it's all about uh, dodging and shooting and, you know, trying to maintain your life. Fortunately, this isn't one of those kind of games where one hit kills you all the time. Uh, you actually do have a life bar and you have, um, you know, a chance to increase that life bar through finding, you know, uh, pathways that give you hidden items and stuff like that which is pretty cool. Um, stages, like I said, are broken up into a few different stages. Uh, they change the music every stage, which is how you know <laughs> that you've entered a new stage. And in fact, if you lose all your lives and get a game over, you can then continue from uh, the beginning of that stage. So it's not 
very unforgiving except for one little thing um that is that the game has absolutely no save system or password system um this game has to be beaten front to back uh as soon as you turn it on uh, um there's nothing even on the switch there's no like save states nothing like that uh it is it is just that it's this is one of those Welcome games to the that old has days of gaming kids this is how it was back in our well, day <laughs> <laughs> it, kind of, except that Legend of Zelda saved, Metroid had passwords, you know, the original Super Mario <laughs> Brothers didn't save, but it also, you know, and it had a secret continue system. Like, it's very few of the games on the NES actually left you, like, kind of high and dry in terms of exploration. And considering that this game has so many levels, it's, yeah, it definitely... Yeah, it is surprising. It, it's a choice, and uh, it'll definitely keep a lot of people from beating this game, but, you know, because, honestly... <laughs> You know, I, I appreciate the, the old school look and the old school charm, but I don't have the old school time. Um, <laughs> you know, I can't I can't just sit there and play a game for uh, the runtime of this game is probably about an hour to an hour and a half, depending on your skill level and familiarity with the game. Um, but, you know, like having all that in in a row on the switch without being able to close the app and like open anything else, you know, like it's. It's it feels a little weird nowadays. I would actually more understand if I had the NES cart, but yeah, as a as a Switch product, it's a little inexplicable. Um like every other like, you know, old ass 8-bit game, you know, is able to be is able to have a save forced upon it at least like in the Nintendo Switch online shop for instance or whatever. Um but I mean, having said, the game is good. Um I did not beat it because, you know, I couldn't put all that time into it in a row. But uh, but I liked what I saw and heard and uh, and, you know, jumped and shot at. <laughs> well, it's a ten dollar game. Is it is it ten dollars worth of fun? Yeah, ten dollars is worth it. Like I said, if you get really good and familiar with the game and stuff, you'll start breezing through the earlier levels. And, you know, you can kind of chip away at it that way. I will say, um you know, my only hesitation is that lack of any kind of progress saving. You know, even a password system would have been, like, fun. It would have been kind of cute to, you know... Even, like, they could have even gotten it down to, like, a four- or six-digit thing. But, anyway, whatever. Um, yeah, I'd say that $10, it's a it's a good, worthwhile game to play. Um, you know, that's... Uh, and, you know, I, I actually, I would totally buy this NES card, except that I already just bought uh, the game Guntner from uh, from Mega Cat, because I know <laughs> the guy that made it. I was just about to ask, do you think this is worth the 40 bucks for a cart? Honestly, kind of, yeah. I would like to play this on an NES. Um, of course, you know, like I said, that's, that's all dependent on how much you actually like to game on an NES, but I always do feel like, you know, when I, when it... It feels right in the context, you know, like not being able to save it on a switch is weird. Not being able to save it on an NES feels like, you know, uh, a day in the life. But um, yeah, I, this is a worthwhile product as far as like being a, um, you know, $40 is not a huge amount for an NES cart that's original. So, yeah, I would actually go ahead and give this a recommendation on that, too. Cool. All right. Well, we made it through this episode. We are all done. Huzzah. We Yippee. did it, I think. Uh, <laughs> indeed, we did it. Uh, big thanks to everyone for coming on, doing their thing. Big thanks to Andy for coming on, chatting with us. Uh, huge thanks to Zolivir Nelson for coming on in the interview in the first half of the show, and to Bree for being there, hanging out for that. Uh, Aki, it's a shame you had to miss that, but it was it was fun anyway. Yeah, I'll manage. <laughs> well, we get you for the next one. But uh, music this episode, uh, I'm trying to think, is there anything that has blue in it? Like some Sonic music should we go with? Blue Water, uh, Blue Sky from, uh, from Jen from uh, Guilty Gear X2. Oh. Pernell's picking the weird ones. The Megas are good. <laughs> we'll go with the weird. Megas. Yeah, they're <laughs> all blue. Weird blue is their that. thing. They, get, they even got like those cool blue guitars and stuff. They do. That's a good choice. So... Music yeah. from the Megas. Does anyone have any final words to end the show? Uh, Megas. <laughs> this is megarific. Normally everyone uh, has plenty of final words, and this episode is like, nope. You got I never have final words. <laughs> I get, never have. Take care of yourself because health care ain't freaking cheap. Come on, Aki, say yeah. something. Entertain us. Fucking donkey balls. There you go. Yeah.